Classic of difficulties. Someone else, way long ago, had a similar problem with figuring out the numbers about the mainstream theory of the heart. It was the 1600s, and for about 1500 years, everybody thought that the liver was actually the main source of blood. They thought that it worked like a fountain, where it just kind of kept pouring out and oozing blood all over the whole body so that all of the tissues got their nourishment and everyone stayed happy. Why did they think this? It's because Galen said it. And who cares about Galen? Well, Galen was the imperial physician to Marcus Aurelius. All you philosophy buffs out there know Marcus Aurelius. He was probably one of the only philosophers that can also claim to have literally been the emperor of Rome. Like, the one emperor. Like, the guy who was completely in charge of everyone in the Roman Empire. So, Galen was his doctor. And he also treated a bunch of gladiators. And who doesn't love gladiators? So, here's the thing about the emperor, not just in Rome, but pretty much anywhere. Whatever the emperor says, it kind of goes, so you really don't disagree with him, or with his doctor for that matter. But then the Roman Empire ended, right? But they still believed Galen in everything he said. They just kind of accepted that whatever Galen said was 100% totally true. They did a similar thing with Aristotle, oddly enough. They even had a saying that meant, well, even he said it. He being either Galen or Aristotle. So it would go something like this. The planets orbit around the Earth and move in perfect circles. Aristotle said so. Or, women are just empty vessels, and men are totally responsible for making babies. Aristotle said so. Or, go get me a sandwich. Aristotle said you have to. Aristotle told me I need extra mayo to. It's obviously a little hard for us modern folk to imagine having this much reliance on a historical figure. We won't even believe what our best friend tells us without Googling it first. So, who was the one daring guy who finally doubted Galen? And what exactly was his beef? Well, this guy's name was William Harvey, and he was the first person, in the West at least, to really suggest that the blood circulates. Why did he start to suspect something was wrong? Well, he looked at how fast blood was moving through the arteries, which, by the way, is pretty fast, and then he said that Well, if it's just squirting out of the liver that fast, and it never returns back to the liver, then how much blood do we go through in a day? The answer was astronomical. Harvey calculated that if the heart beats a certain number of times per minute, and if at each beat two ounces of fluid are released, then in an hour, the body would have to create 540 pounds of blood. So in order to make that much blood out of food, as Galen's theory would have it, we would need to eat at least that much food per hour, if not more. And obviously we don't do this. So we need to find another explanation. So Harvey reasoned to himself, it just wouldn't be a very good system if we didn't figure out how to reuse the blood, and we just kept making new blood constantly. So Harvey looked around, and he found evidence that blood goes out from the heart in the arteries and comes back in the veins, just like we were talking about earlier. And he did all of this empirically, with cool little experiments and with vivisection, which, by the way, is dissection of a living animal. It's one of the best ways to study the blood circulation. So, like, it's still alive, and you cut open this animal without anesthesia, and then you have to cut open arteries and veins and stuff and see how the blood squirts out. Often, it's a pig. And since it's a pig, it squeals. So the first order of business is usually cutting the nerve to its voice box, which, um, by the way, Galen became very famous for doing, by the way, it was one of his tricks that he did in the public square. And then at the end, you either stitch the pig back up and hope it lives, or you just kill the pig. It's a pretty brutal process. But from this brutal process, and from Harvey's other much less brutal experiments, He came up with this model, and he made a bunch of cool little old-timey pictures with disembodied hands, wearing fancy little frilly gloves, and pushing on the external veins and arteries of a burly farmer that he happened to find. And all of these diagrams are labeled and neat and delightfully clear. They're really spectacular. He didn't have a microscope, though, so he couldn't see the capillaries. So he had to make this massive leap of faith. He said... I see the blood going one way, 
and I see the blood coming back the other way, but I don't see how the blood gets from the arteries to the veins. He happened to be right, but he definitely could have been wrong. It was a good guess, really. And here's the thing. Harvey mapped everything out, saying that the blood circulated. But he didn't say why the blood circulated, because saying why, well, that's not really the purview of the empirical scientist. He just wanted to know how things move the way they did. The question of why, if we can even get to that, comes much, much later. So Harvey mapped it out. Sometimes he said that the blood moved itself. Sometimes he said that the heart had something to do with it. He definitely did not espouse a theory that the heart is a pump and squeezes the blood like we describe it today. So the question becomes, who said that it does that? Well, the first guy is really Descartes. Good old Descartes. Poster child of the Enlightenment. I think, therefore I am. The guy who really just wanted to be a disembodied brain, floating in a vat of jello so that he could endlessly think forever and ever and ever. In his Discourse on Method, which is a short, tight little book written in French, not Latin, which, by the way, is super revolutionary at the time to write something in the common language, in one of the later chapters, he says, You know who's doing a really great job right now? My contemporary, William Harvey. He's just being such a good empiricist and figuring out how to throw out traditional old knowledge by doing specific experiments carefully. He's a guy who's really using his brain right now. And me, being Descartes, I want to see people using their brains. That way, we can all end up living in a giant tub of jello. So Descartes, he didn't want any kind of vital force in the picture. He wanted a mechanical universe that would obey mechanical laws. Ultimately, Descartes really wanted God and spirituality and anything spooky to be relegated to the back seat, and he wanted thinking to take center stage, because the phrase, I think, therefore I am, means that the only thing that I can be sure of is my own thinking, and through my own thinking, I am sure that I exist. Only from this knowledge that I exist does the knowledge of anything else originate. This includes God and knowledge of God. It comes secondary to the knowledge that I exist. So how does the knowledge of new things come to us? Well, thinking about stuff, of course. So it's a worldview that's definitionally egocentric, mind-centric, and totally abstracted from any kind of meaning or significance outside of the individual in his mind. So what does Descartes say about Harvey? He says that Harvey has outlined this magnificent idea that the heart doesn't deal with any of those vital principles that Galen talked about, any of that magic stuff of life, but that the heart just pumps the blood, like a mechanical pump, and that's all there is to it. No spirit, no soul, nothing but squeezing and squirting. And that's where we're at now. Unlike literally everything else in Western medicine and science, we haven't really changed what we think about the heart in 400 years, which is really weird because we can barely agree on anything in science, let alone agree on anything for any amount of time, let alone 400 years. So either Descartes was really super right, or there's something amiss here. <laughs> <laughs> 